thanks to the Writers' Center um, for hosting this year of Plume 9. We've had um, five amazing sessions, and now we have um, our sixth and final session. And the book is available. I'll pop the link in in a moment. Um, the wonderful book is available. And I'll give a round of introductions really quickly to say a quick thank you to Emily Holland, who's hosting mm -hmm. us today with Amy Freeman, um, both at the Writers' Center, um, Zach Powers, who organized all the website stuff and has been really instrumental in powering us forward, isn't here today, but thanks to him at mm -hmm. the Writers' Center as well. Um, we have our team here, Amanda and Nancy, who are co-hosts of Film 9's um, Zoom version, um, along with Danny. And I'm going to give a very quick um, round to Danny. He's going to take, take it from here for a moment. I'm Leah. Welcome. Wonderful to see everyone. I'm in Washington, D.C. And over to Danny for a moment um, to introduce Film 9. Ah. Thank you, Leah, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I can show you the book. I just happen to have a copy right here. Uh, it is a departure from our usual format, and I, I had something to read, but maybe I'll just wing it. Um, in the past, uh, I would so ask maybe 90 poets for their poems, and they would send them, and uh, they are usually pretty familiar names. Um, but this time I wanted to, I started to think about the poetry that we published got to be sort of uh, less diverse than I wanted it to be. And I got tired of being the sole gatekeeper. It just didn't seem appropriate any longer. Uh, so what I did uh, and have done in Plume Poetry 9, in which we will continue in Plume Poetry 10, I asked 45 uh, really essentially guest editor, well-known poets, if one can say well-known in the poetry world, uh, well-known poets to choose a poet that for any reason, and there are many reasons, that they feel are deserving of a greater and wider readership. And their task was to contact this poet and ask for a poem. And so we would publish in a little four page sequence, the well-established poet's poem. And then he, she, or they would write a brief introduction to the poet they had selected. And then we would publish that person's poem. And the partner pairs turned out to be just wonderfully, um, sometimes very strange and unexpected, and sometimes um, almost uncannily um, complementary of one another. It's an odd, it's an odd thing, but I, I really wonder. It worked wonderfully, and I'm very pleased with it. And as I say, we'll continue it in uh, Plume Poetry Ten, which it's unbelievably we've already had to start. And I think I have half of the uh, contributors already, so waiting on some more. But it, judging by what we have so far, it looks good. And I'm very pleased. And I'm thank I want to thank everyone who has come this evening, the poets themselves, of course. And I look forward to hearing you, read, you may choose to read the poem that you uh, published in Plume in the anthology, or you may choose something else. That's entirely up to you. But... I'll hand it back to Leah uh, with my great gratitude to all of you. Thank you. Leah. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. That's great. Um, I, I just wanted to make a request uh, to everyone to mute themselves if um, you haven't had a chance to already. I'm hearing some, some really interesting noises, which actually kind of seem to complement things. but. Um, I can't do that at my end, so um, if you don't mind, that would be great. And um, what we're going to do this evening is we're going to, um, I'm going to introduce the guest editor, poet, and, um, and then my guest editor, poet, is going to introduce the poet that he has brought to Plume 9, or she has brought to Plume 9, and we're going to start with um, Ron, Ron Smith, 
Um, Ron, Ron was Poet Laureate of Virginia in, from 2014 to 16 and is the author of five books, four of them from LSU Press, including Moon Road and The Humility of the Brutes. That's such a great title. The forthcoming That Beauty in the Trees, again from LSU. His first book, Running Again in Hollywood Cemetery, was judged by Margaret Atwood as a close runner-up for the National Poetry Series Open Competition in 2020. And, is, um, and has appeared in a revised and enhanced second edition for Mad Hat, actually, in 2020. Ron is writer in residence at St. Christopher's School in Richmond, Virginia. Welcome, Ron. And Ron's going to read from um, his plume um, poem from Plume Nine. Um, and if we have time at the end, we're going to go around and read another poem, but we're going to start with one round of poems begin with. So you want Thank me to read you. mine first and then introduce Seward or the other yes. one? Yes. Will you read yours first and then introduce Stuart? Yes. Um, the poem is entitled in, in Plume Nine. It's called Eric Blair's Wall. And uh, every human being is complicated, but George Orwell seems much more complicated than most people. Uh, I've always been fascinated by him and his work, but uh, I decided a few years ago to to explore his connection with sport. And I discovered um, that he, besides fishing, the only sport he ever really cared about was Eaton's bizarre wall game, which is played up against a brick wall. Uh, and the more I read about Blair and then about the uh, wall game, Eric Blair, George Orwell, the more I came to feel that the game was a metaphor for, for the man. And, uh, Finally, I decided I would do a one-page biography controlled by that, that vehicle of the wall game. So you need five terms here before I fling this thing at you. Uh, the bully is a rugby-style scrum. Oppidons at Eton College are students who board in town rather than in the school proper. To sneak, uh, you may not sneak in uh, the wall game. That means you can't, it's, it's a form of offsides. Um, don't ask me to explain how you get off sides in this game because I do not know. Um, Colts, uh, oh, to furk is to hook the ball backwards, but a player is allowed to furk in the Colts. And the Colts uh, is the last few yards of each end of the field in some ways similar to the uh, end zone in a football, American football. And uh, that's, uh, there, there's more to say, but... Uh, Let's just go to the poem. It's called Eric Blair's Wall. And it, uh, part of the fun was making it look like a wall on the page. Eric Blair's Wall. Our Tory anarchist boiled in the bully against the brick. The wall game scrum the bully. Not for him the playing fields of Eton. Only this warped offspring of rugby. Bricks abrading cheeks, elbows, knees. Aristocratic rabble on its way to Oxford. Cambridge, except for Blair, self-snatched from a Sussex River he liked to fish, another sport with few rules. Shielding his proper parents from his boolean orness, armpit truths, astringent facts, hard head always smack up against unyielding identicals, alternative to grow into. The road to Wigan Pier went through Burma, where he was the wall, Burmese criminals the scrum, the scum, the bully, he occasionally hanged, shot an elephant, harmless wall of a creature because a mob craved a glimpse of empire in its teenage cop. A good hater, now he hated himself, wore what I call a Hitler mustache. At the Aragon front, it was, quote, unspeakably cold when he got over a pissant wall for a few seconds, was shortly thereafter, thank God, shot by a fascist sniper before a communist could drill him in the back. Eaton's wall's furrow was 15, is 15 by 110 meters along a barrier articulated in the Enlightenment. A wall's a team, but a bully's the chaos inside a boy whose aim is to keep you from forming the tunnel that could funnel the ball toward your culks. Periscope of a man, bullet zipping through the delicate mesh of neck, out of action at just the right time, 
reluctant imperialist, skeptical communist, Edwardian revolutionary, weak lungs of Eric Blair, fired brick of George Orwell, wall and boy, immovable object, flimsy flesh, firm no to Auden's necessary murder. Men lying everywhere, lying men shooting everybody, everybody shooting everybody else in Barcelona. I've seen the Ministry of Truth. His wife worked there not far from his desk at the BBC. By now, his mustache thin as a knife blade, and so was he. Flagpole, he looked down his nose at you and me, director or drudge, only literally. Saw the age of reason curved into enclosure was the tramp and the policeman who moved the tramp along. I don't know what it walled in or out. He was on the ownership side, King's scholar, whom, whose realm Oppidans invaded twice a year, pouring over the wall. Spectators saw a bunch of butts, rarely a ball. Goals? One a decade. You may push your fist into a player's face, but not Firk or Sneak. I, too, have been a guardian of tradition and meaningless mayhem. In the only film of Blair, we see him marching arm in arm with his team, every boy in a long scarf and a cap. They're a wall approaching a wall. I can't be sure, but everyone seems to be smiling. And there's our man, fourth from the left, towering above his peers, head high, and I swear, smiling. And now we go to Stuart, right? Yes, thank you, Sydney. Uh, Perfect. Stuart Gunner has always. I mean, loved. thank you, Ron. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, his first book manuscript has had, as Emerson said, of Leaves of Grass, a long foreground. Over the past two years, though, Stuart has published on average about a poem a month in, as well as Plume Nine, Atlanta Review, Plain Songs, Poet Lore, Coal Mountain Review, Chattahoochee Review, and elsewhere lovely poems, quietly musical, rich and richly felt. Take it away, Stuart. Thanks, Ron. Um, I was planning to read my Plume 9 poem, but on Danny's blessing, I'm going to try a different one, um, if that's all right with y'all. I figured you can read the one in Plume. Yeah, that's great. This poem came from a project I took part in where it was cool because I collected lots of postcards with poems on them and I sent out a bunch of poems on postcards to the people participating. And this was a postcard that had a building that looked like a museum on the front of it. And from the inspiration of that picture came this poem. And I think it, uh, well, I'll let you decide what you think it is. Museum. For Kahindi Wiley, Marcus David Peters, and George Floyd. I walk up to the locked doors in the drizzling rain and try to get in. I turn to the Chihuly reeds along the side of the building, then wander over the gravel courtyard to rumors of war. Folks up on Monument Avenue are celebrating Juneteenth at Marcus David Peters Memorial Park, playing basketball, grilling hot dogs. There is a band. All of this in the shadow of Lee's statue. Traveler was too small for the sculptor who chose to use a different horse. My friend is writing a song about this from the horse's point of view as a slave. That evening, the image of George Floyd looks on the people in the grass, his image emblazoned in lights on the graffitied spray painted plinth. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Ron. 
Such great reading voices as well. I was, I was sort of setting, settling back. Um, thank you. We'll move on to Sydney. Sydney Lee is 2021 recipient of his home state, Vermont's most prestigious artist distinction, the Governor's Award for Excellence in the Arts. Congratulations, Sydney. A former Pulitzer finalist and winner of the Poets Prize, he served as founding editor of the New England Review and was Vermont's Poet Laureate from 2011 to 2015. He recently published his 13th collection of poems with four-way books called Here. In fall 2021, Vermont Green Writers Press published Seen from All Sides, Lyric and Everyday Life. His collected newspaper columns from his years as Vermont Poet Laureate. Thank you, Sydney. Welcome. You're still muted. There you thank go. you very thank you very much, Leah. And uh, I, uh, I, it's not quite face to face, but I'm glad I have a chance to look at Danny and thank him for all he has done, not just for me and for everybody here, but for the world of poetry at large. Uh, he's uh, uh, he's sui generis. I think there aren't anybody, many other people who are as generous with their time and their intelligence and their. Uh, expertise as he, so I'm grateful to uh, appear in any association with him. I'll read the poem from uh, the anthology, and it's called Augury. I can't explain, but it's true. At 10 years old, I beheld the lemon and slate of the slender fish flashing below the surface. My father told me to settle back. My gawking over the gunnel rocked our canoe, E.M. White Guide's model with feathered hole planks, the one he called a work of art. It is. I have it now. I'd taken a minnow, or I should say that he had, from the bait pail, which I called a cage. I'd run the hook, or rather he had, through a dorsal, and then cast feebly five yards, maybe six. The bobber shivered. Yank, yelled my father. I set the hook and the world took on a meaning it had never had. I know, what a claim, I know. But that's how it felt, a thrill, but also something like trauma. That's how it felt. No, I can't explain. The only way to reel the new world back to something I could grasp, and did I want that, would be to boat my catch. Easy after all. I'd learned in time a pickerel's not a prize, not the so-called serious anglers. True, the fish made a desperate rush toward a spread of pads, just then folding their lilies, but then came back almost docile to the long-handled net that awaited. My father used forceps to pull the hook to avoid the menacing teeth. An evening star stole out. Mist began to sheathe the shore. It slipped the gown on the dockside pine. I could just discern the eyes of the fish like tiny shards of china. I dreamed I'd glimpsed the course of my future years, rife with exploits and color. Why would a child fetch up such a ludicrous vision? I'm not the one to answer. And yet, however tame my life may have been, compared to some at least, I believe that Vatic moment held some truth. Oh, I'd catch bigger and better fish. I'd know bigger, better things at large. But that pickerel gleams to this day in the hands of that gentle parent, dead and too young, full dark looming, eased it back to the lake. It's really a pleasure to introduce uh, Katie, and I'm with your indulgence, it's not very long, but I'll, I'll just read the little introduction I wrote for the anthology. Any teacher of she or he is candid will testify that surprisingly, even dishearteningly, few students in their work lodge themselves in the mind. 
I taught at the undergraduate and graduate level for 43 years, the last 10 in a graduate program at Dartmouth. Of the handful who truly impressed me, Katie Moritz remains foremost. A commonplace of my experience was that certain students had critical acumen, whereas others communicated impulses and ideas through their creative work alone, feeling uncertain about their evaluative capacities. Katie Moritz seems blessed with both endowments. On the one hand, she is more at ease than most, certainly than I, with abstract thought. On the other, as her poem in the anthology indicates, not only an excellent writer, but also a disarmingly original one. Her title, Not a Great Image, is cannily self-dismissive, the poem in question rife as it is with striking imagery, reminding us that the very word image is part and parcel of imagination. It reminds me, too, that Katie's poems, however subtle, often imply a slightly surrealist perspective, somewhat reminiscent of certain Central and Eastern European sensibilities. Donald Hall famously claimed that writing workshops and MFA programs generated what he sneeringly labeled McPoems. Now, if there's any virtue to that assertion, and full disclosure, I've always been a Hall skeptic, Katie Moritz's poetry is absolutely immune from that blanket judgment. And I'm proud to have been her friend and familiar for some time now and to share space with her in the anthology. Katie, take it away. Thank you, Sid. Uh, it's very nice to hear and that means a lot. And um, I'm just so grateful to share this space uh, with you and with everybody here tonight. Um, this is, I think, my first actual poetry reading ever of all time. So I'm really excited. Um, and I'm going to read the poem that's in the anthology. Um, I, I wrote this poem when I was pregnant with my son, Ulysses. Um, and uh, thinking a lot about um, the responsibility that comes with bringing a child into this world um, as it warms and changes. Um, and I saw this photograph um, in National Geographic's um, called A Gathering of Unicorns. And it's a photo of these narwhals in the Arctic um, and the ice melting away. And that kind of inspired this poem. So I'll just go here. So it's called Not a Great Image. I'm sorry, these aren't that great, she says, as she scoops the ultrasound probe deeper. The room is icy. I am alone except for the tech, staring at the screen, unsure what I am seeing. The text says white lines are bones. The gray of a kittiwake gull rounds out for a moment. A pause melts into a flutter before a nothing. Then from the black space emerges a ridge line, arching into the orb of a glacial white skull. What made me decide this? As the virus spreads relentless in its destruction, I think, aren't we like a virus too? I lie there, my face hot beneath my mask, the world warming around the images before me. And I think of those narwhals next to each other in an Arctic uterus, their tusks mostly aligned like a spine. Behind the narwhals, a cluster of jagged chunks of ice beginning to break, but with someone there to witness it. Thank you. I have a knot in my stomach. Oh, that was just beautiful. Thank you both so much. Just quite. I love that you read that out, Sydney. Um, I felt like I was in a poetry masterclass as well, just thinking about all those things. Thank you both so much, Katie, Sydney. I can't believe that was your first reading. Seriously? Yeah. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> We have to have you back. That'd um, be awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to have you back. <laughs> I will move on to our final pairing. That's what Danny likes to call it. Do you still like to call it that, Danny? Um, yeah. Um, Amit and um, Jane, Amit Majmudar and Jane Swart. Amit Majmudar is a diagnostic nuclear radiologist who lives in Westerville, Ohio, with his wife and three children. 
former first, uh, he was actually the former first poet laureate of Ohio. That's, that's great. And he is the author of the poetry collections, What He Did in Solitary and Dot Head, as well as two other poetry collections for internationally acclaimed novels, an anthology of political poetry and a translation of the Bhagavad Gita. It was Diwali yesterday. Happy Diwali. Happy Diwali. Oh, yeah. Awarded the Donald Justice Prize and the Pushcart Prize. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the New, the New Yorker, Best of the Best American Poetry, and the 11th edition of the North, Norton Introduction to Literature. Two novels are forthcoming in India in 2022, a historical novel about the 1947 partition entitled The Map and the Scissors, and a novel for young readers, Heroes, The Color of Dust. He's currently co-creating a graphic novel, web comic, The Kaliyog Chronicles. You can find him on amitmajmudar.com. Thank you, Amit. It's great thank to you. see you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much to Plume. And I know with Danny um, and also with Nancy, I've had this uh, really long relationship. And I always tell when people like ask me, you know, hey, I want to, you know, read some of your poetry and, and this and that. I always tell them to actually go to your website because I think that over the years, Plume has actually um, always been able just, they always select my best work. And a lot of times I feel very confident if I direct someone to Plume's website, not only my poetry, like the selection of my poetry that's there, that's accumulated there over the years is the, like some of my favorites, my personal favorites, but I know that all the other stuff is not going to miss, you know? So when they read other people's stuff on there, um, you guys don't miss. And so I'm so grateful. And Leah, I'm so Happy to meet you as a yes. part of the uh, the Plume team. Yes, and, and in fact, I was going to I'm going to jump in here for just a second, and you know, Nancy Nancy Mitchell was saying, um, Nancy, do you want to jump in for a second? Um, that that you were one of the first poets that she interacted with um, at Plume. <laughs> the very first, was it? Yes, um, Amit, you were my very first interview with your wonderful Abbasidarian, that yeah. wicked, fabulous, sexy poet. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. it was so much fun. And it was great. And then we had we were able to do another one uh, a year ago, I think, that was yes. just yes. so terrific and you know, a, a very different tone. <laughs> yes, and you you were wonderful. And uh, Billy Collins liked your your interview too, actually. And, oh. and so I talked to him about it and, uh, that was his, uh, that was that the, the one that you guys published was his favorite poem out of the book dot head. And so I kind of, uh, sent him over to your, to your interview and, and he was really, uh, supportive of it and praising it. So, um, yeah, no, I, I remember that. I remember that. And you guys have, have always been so good to, to me and to poets in general, um, and to so many poets. And I think we all, we all, we all love Plume, and um, I'm going to read the poem that's in the anthology. It's called The Studio at Meudon, and it's about the friendship between Rilke and Rodin. And I thought that I would select that poem because it was kind of appropriate relative to what the, how the anthology was being put together. Um, of course, Rodin is a sculptor and, and Rilke was a poet, but Rilke... Um, when he was very young in, and starting out in his career, he, um, he went to Rodin and he kind of learned about how to be an artist and how to, you know, pursue his craft, even though his craft was a different medium. And um, he, he wrote a book about Rodin as well um, early in his career, like a monograph about him. And so as far as like the references are concerned, there aren't too many. I think you all, all you need to know um, as far as like illusions are concerned is that um, Rodin um, created a, a whole bunch of busts of Honoré de Balzac, who is this writer, and you can find him online. He just couldn't get enough of the head of this, this caffeinated, corpulent, super prolific novelist. And so the poem refers to that. And it also refers to this one um, uh, 
panther at the at this at this zoo in in Paris, um, which Rilke has a poem about. Um, and so that's really all you need to know, I think. So <clears throat> the first part is Rodin talking to Rilke, and the second part is Rilke talking to Rodin. All this said Rodin to Rilke with a wave that seemed to brush away his own statues, finished and unfinished. All this began with toys. They find these objects, archaeologists in their ditches, anthropologists slapping their necks in Brazil. They tell us, look, here is an idol. This is a god. This is the animal the god rides. I have studied their treasures. Those are wheels on the bottom of the horse. Those are seeds in a rattle, not a shaman's fetish to summon clouds. These things are custom made for a child's hand. In fired clay or corn husks and mud and wood burned up by sunlight long before our era of museums came to be. Each toy perished with the girlhood it was fashioned to delight. I make my things in marble. You make your things in words. But our materials are an accident of history. On another continent, in another tribe, I might have carved bone. You might have shaped rain. Playthings. Study playthings. Make sure your horses, your panthers, all have wheels beneath them. Then set them rolling off into the future. There will be a child. There will be a hand. Skin, said Rilke to Rodin. The poet's fingers yearning to flit moth-like over the rough draft of a bus, bust. Skin needs texture to breathe. Canova's psyche, that polish, that neoclassical flawlessness he gave her bosom and her naked arms, skin with no pores, suffocating smoothness. You have made so many heads of Balzac now, 40, 50 heads, and all of them breathe. They are pressure heads. Each one a scalding geyser, your bare hands fought down and froze into a face. A blind man's fingers could read and recognize as Balzac. You sculpt forces, not forms. I, too, want to coax my medium into a state unnatural to it. The poem is the thing. Even if it has to be a caged panther, still a panther, the one at the Jardin des Plantes. I want to pace inside his cage. When he eats me alive, I want him to start with my tongue. Um, and now I have the delight of uh, introducing Jane, Jane Zwart. Um, Jane and I, um, on the one hand, don't have anything in common, and yet on the other hand, um, have everything in common. Um, she, we've only met once, uh, but we correspond a lot. And one of the things we do is every once in a while, we shoot a bunch of titles, we shoot titles back at each other. And then like back and forth, I come up with one, she comes up with one. And then we extemporize a poem in isolation from each other that day, and then we, we send it to each other just to see what we came up with. And uh, both she and I have uh, published a, a bunch of poems that were generated that way. And, and we, we, we write little emails, we're like, hey, remember that one where you, rec where you recommended that title? Well, that's going here and that's going there. And it's just a wonderful creative relationship that, that she and I have. And, um, and I respect her tremendously as a poet. And this is a short paragraph of the introduction I wrote. Um, Jane Zwart's poetry is devotional, a triune devotion to her family, to her faith, and to her language. Her poems make sense in the best way. Their word logic 
taps the etymology of logic in logos, word, the word that was in the beginning. Accordingly, she writes as a mother, a contemplative, and as a musician, all three at once. In this poem, Learning to Read, notice how words that might have clustered solely by sonic kinship, hull, syllabically, bulb, are linked no less by logic and love. Love of words in this case, and reading, and her reader. I encourage you then to, quote, drain the snow globe of her poetry, to, quote, press your lips to the dipper annealed in stars. Jane, on to you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, all my thanks to Amit for inviting me and holding the door into this anthology open behind him so that I could sneak in. Um, and my thanks to, to Plume and everyone there, um, yeah, for your great generosity. I am going to read um, the poem from the anthology as well, um, which is called Learning to Read. Against what does one break the ampule of a word? Almost never can you crack the glass, the phonic code by shutting the book hard around the capsule as one would shell a nut between a wood doll's jaws. Books are full of tall and sawdust and most words resist brute force and roll whole and still secret from their chapters into your lap. Sometimes you can hull a word syllabically, bulb by bulb, and the sound inside each a reel will hold its shape long enough for you to pop it in your mouth. And as with the beads freed from a pomegranate, you can loose the juice from the seeds with your teeth. Yes, to swallow some file along with a filter is almost a sure thing, but the small harm that does is good practice. Keep boring your way into the glass flasks and soon, soon you will find the vials boil and pull its seal cleanly and drink. Soon you will trade the little vessel in, soon swig from the bottle crammed with a ship, soon drain the snow globe, soon press your lips to the dipper annealed in stars. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. It's a, it's a great party. I feel like there's so many different voices and different poems. Wow, thank you so much. I know Danny likes to keep things very short because then everyone goes on with the rest of their evening. We're at about 5.40, we usually wrap up. Um, um, though I don't want to leave quite yet. Um, does anyone have, does anyone want to jump, anyone want to jump in and ask a quick question? Um, I don't think we're going to have time for another round of poems um, today, but is um, there any questions for the poet or for Danny? No? Okay. It's the capital of South Dakota. What's the cap? <laughs> Who's that? Who's that? Is that so I, I, I have a question uh, for any any of the readers, which is, um, do you read your work aloud to yourself um, before you publish it? Yes. I'll take my answer offline. Off the off uh, the air. That was an old radio joke. Never mind. I, I do not. Uh, I used to. I don't know why I don't anymore. I, but I do know that if I give public reading, especially of poems that are relatively new, and I discover myself kind of skipping over something as inconspicuously as I can, that uh, it's important to go back and do a little more revision. 
but I don't know why I stopped that because it's so crucial. I think I made poems of this column of air coming up and out into the universe. So they're meant to be heard. They're a lyric once accompanied by the lyre. And maybe I should go back to it using your example. Yeah, that's that's such a great question. Um, Amy, I, I was actually thinking about how, how much people have enjoyed hearing the poems, um, and these zoom readings, just having a chance to hear poets, they don't ever really come together with, um, in the same way, I guess you can, you know, listen to a YouTube reading, which is quite common now, but to be able to hold a space, Nancy does it beautifully with, um, poets on the plaza. And I feel like um, this is something that we may hold on to as we go forward, um, this chance to be together and um, hear these poems out loud, and not just on the page. Really appreciate everyone being here today. I would just, um, you know, in each issue of Plume, we have usually Nancy will record two or three poems. Oh. And that's a wonderful experience, too. Um, but to see and to hear and to see the, particularly with Anna, I suppose, the gestural effects of the visual linked with the um, audio of the poem is really astounding. I wonder if, and we have done this in the past, too, included videos of poets reading their work. I wonder if maybe we should somehow make incorporate this into poem, into plume issues, if we could get a, a video and an audio of one or two poets. But we'll see about that. We have the audio. and uh, But this is one of, I will say, one of the best readings that we have done in these, this series. And, uh, I'm so pleased that uh, you, you're very kind words about Plume, but they're really not about me. It's really about everybody else on the staff. I can't believe I say staff. It's so odd for me to even think of having a staff and me being, much less me being in charge of somebody, which I'm really not. Uh, but it's very kind of all of you to, to speak well of the journal. Um, when we first began this 10 years ago now, it was just sort of a, Okay, get out one little issue and declare a victory and march away. And 10 years later, it's become this little thing. And it's very really pleasing for me to see what it's become. And uh, for that, I thank you all. Thank you, Danny. And thanks, actually. I should say a special thank you to Stuart um, as well, because I feel like this particular edition of um, at the Writers' Center. The sixth edition after the, the anthology came out was partly inspired by um, wanting to have him read. And it was just incredible to have his voice here too. Um, so thanks, Stuart, for, for galvanizing us a little to keep going a little longer. Um, this has been so wonderful. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, Jane, Katie, Sydney, Ron, um, Stuart. Thank you so much for being here and thanks to the Writers' Center and to Amanda, and Nancy and Sally and Danny. Um, really appreciate it. Um, you can all stay if you want another minute, but I'm, you're, you're free to, to leave if, you, if you'd like to. So we wrap up right on time.